we can continue. Welcome to those of you who've just joined us. Uh, it's a great pleasure now to look forward <laughs> to Gisbert van der Brink's paper, Should We Call Planet Earth Safe? Over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Brook. Uh, so I just want you to, to uh, think about your gut response to this question uh, for a moment. So, so perhaps you know for sure the answer is yes or the answer is no. And of course I would be curious to see whether that changes over time after I have been giving my talk or not. So, 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 so just make, uh, I'm not going to ask you to reveal your opinions right now, but just make up your mind about, about this very uh, uh, question. It's a nice, uh, nice experiment. So um, I think there is, there is quite some consensus in contemporary eco Christian ecotology um, that traditional metaphors uh, for construing the relationship between uh, God, humans, and a non-human creation, um, such as uh, humans being in dominion, humans being vice regents, or even kings, or, and uh, humans being stewards of creation, um, have not prevented us from creating a lot of ecological havoc. Uh, and in that sense, uh, haven't been able to do the work they perhaps should, be, uh, should have been doing. So that we are in need of other models that metaphors to, uh, metaphors to, to uh, reflect upon this relationship between God, humans and non, the non-human uh, creation. Uh, even those who would like to um, retain, uh, the, the, for example, the stewardship uh, metaphor, even though they, they take issue with it on some points, they will typically argue that we need additional models and metaphors besides that one to do more justice to our intrinsic connection with the non-human creation rather than just uh, talking to, about it in external terms. So one of the drawbacks of this um, uh, stewardship metaphor, which is generally acknowledged, is for example that um, it's, it's fairly wide and broad. It can be... Um, uh, implemented in very different sort of ways. Uh, if you look into American politics, from, for example, uh, from the far right to the far left, everyone can um, use this metaphor of uh, humans as stewards, but they come to very different, widely div uh, divergent conclusions as to what that would mean in actual uh, practice. Also, it's quite managerial, so it suggests that we're here to make profit so somehow from, from the, as a, like a manager uh, or a steward is actually supposed to do. So, so there are some drawbacks to that, to that um, um, metaphor, which has as a result that um, many of us typically try to downplay it a bit. If you look into Laudato Si, the uh, well-known uh, encyclical of, uh, of Pope Francis, you see he used it twice. Two times he uses the metaphor of uh, stewardship uh, you know, in a bit of downplayed way, uh, not, not dismissing it, but uh, using other metaphors uh, more, more uh, frequently. So, among these other metaphors, notions of kinship between humans and non-humans are typically emphasized, or entanglement, or uh, mutual interdependence, etc., or even sacramentality, especially in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, there's a tendency to emphasize the sacramental character of, uh, of creation. In this paper, I would like to explore uh, perhaps a slightly more radical way uh, to overcome the generally felt unease with stewardship, namely by asking whether uh, the earth might be called uh, sacred or holy. I'm not going to make a distinction between these two concepts of sacredness or sacrality and holiness. I'm open to hear any suggestions you may have. I'm not a native speaker of English, so perhaps you have different overtones, heard different overtones in these two concepts. I'm open to uh, be, be informed about that, but I use them as synonymous in this paper. Um, I'm asking the question from a kind of mainstream Christian perspective, since I believe that if our the the uh, theology um, is to make a real difference uh, in the world, then it should also be, it should be recognizable to, to mainstream Christians as being in some sort of continuity with historic Christianity. Uh, so so, so uh, I'm not trying to do a very radical, uh, uh, proposing a very radical break with historical Christianity here. Can the earth be called sacred? At first sight, the prospects uh, seem fairly dim. Calling planet earth sacred uh, is usually associated with nature religions, uh, with paganism or neo-paganism, uh, and or with Gaia speculations. Yet in what follows, I would like to argue that the claim that nature or the earth uh, is sacred is not an exclusive characteristic of indigenous uh, or neo-pagan religions, but can also be upheld from a Christian doctrinal perspective. I draw on earlier work here by American ethicist David Gushy, who has devo developed an ethics based on the sanctity of human life, but then expanded this notion, this notion so as to include rather than exclude uh, the created world. 
Uh, I proceed in a slightly different way than, uh, than he does, though. So uh, here's my uh, table of contents. Then you have a um, notion of what you can uh, expect. I'm now moving from one to two. To. Um, I try. I, I have four uh, sheets of paper. Usually I talk for five minutes uh, about a sheet of paper. So I'm now at the bottom of page one. So you can now calculate how much longer you have to uh, listen to me. So a visceral response to uh, the question whether the earth is sacred might be, wait a minute, God alone is holy. Uh, no one else. And I must admit that for a long time I, intuitive, I intuitively thought along such lines myself. Um, the creator is holy, whereas created nature is profane. And in one of my books they even claim that much, um, suggesting that there's an important difference there between Greek philosophical worldview on the one hand, taken very roughly, and uh, the Christian worldview on the other. Um, so, um, so suggesting that perhaps uh, prominent, most prominently in Neoplatonic uh, emanation philosophy, uh, the world shares in the holiness of the divine realm, uh, whereas in the Christian perspective, by contrast, the world is profane. Whereas as a Christian, I would still say that the created world is not divine, uh, I'm now less certain about its profaneness. Uh, so I now think I should have been more careful in that previous book from the 90s, um, uh, in making a distinction between divinity on the, on the one hand and sacrality on the other. For even a cursory look into Christianity's foundational documents suffices to see that the attribute of holiness is not at all restricted to the Creator. In fact, holiness as it were radiates from God and infuses people and places, times and things that stand in a special relationship to God. The Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, the Jerusalem Temple as well as the sanctuary in the, in the desert uh, are holy, including all objects they contain. Mount Sinai is holy as are certain festival days and times and of course the people of Israel is called holy. Uh, and summoned to uh, behave accordingly. Obvious, obviously, the holiness of God is intended to permeate the way in which humans live, prompting them to treat certain things, uh, times and places with utmost cautiousness. Interestingly, holiness is not a black or white thing in the Hebrew Bible. As is well known, the temple was divided into three parts, each of them different in uh, grade of holiness, uh, if you can, uh, can say so. So, so um, you had the court of the Gentiles, which was profane, then the holy part, and then the holy of holies. Correspondingly, people and things can also gradually become more and more holy. So there's, it's a graded concept in a sense. In the New Testament, not only Jesus and the Spirit of God, but also followers of Jesus are called holy. Believers, or saints, as they are more frequently called, are summoned to sanctify themselves, that is, to more and more devote their lives to God, by following Christ's example and strive for the kingdom of God. Remarkably, in the New Testament, uh, holiness language does not decrease, as one might think. On the contrary, for the first time, the Jewish law, scriptures, prophets, and temple are called holy, as, it, as is even the kiss with which Christians use to greet each other five times in the New Testament. This is called uh, the holy kiss. And today, in the wake of a certain event at the end of the World Championship in Spain, we seem to realize uh, more than, uh, than ever how meaningful the qualification holy um, is in this connection. Moving towards our central question now, can a natural world or the earth be called holy in the Bible? The answer is no, or rather, not yet. In the Hebrew Bible, the words uh, kadosh and haaretz are never combined into one expression. So the earth is not called holy. And this does not change in the New Testament. Perhaps it is because holiness always presupposes its counterpart, namely profanity, uh, in the sense of commonness. Um, uh, since to be holy means to be exempted from the common destination of objects, times, places and people, sacredness presupposes that there is such a common profane real realm on earth. It's only in the eschatological end times that the boundary between the holy and the profane will be removed, as all pots and pans will be sanctified, as uh, the prophet Zechariah has it, and as the new earth and its inhabitants will fully share in the, in the divine holiness, as the author of Revelation says it. Apparently, profanity is then no longer needed as the counterpart of holiness, as the world at large is destined to become holy. Now moving to section 3, interestingly in the post-biblical traditions the number of entities that were called holy was never strictly limited to uh, the biblical examples. Rather one extrapolated from these to call things holy which seem to stand in a similar special relationship to God. So the tradition does not encourage us to proceed in a biblicist way here. For example, believers who supposedly had reached a superior stage of moral purity could be called holy ones or saints in a special sense, a tendency against which the Protestant Reformation turned itself because in this way two classes of Christians um, 
um, came to be distinguished, which threatened the fundamental notion that all believers are equal and that all of them can only be saved by grace. Yet even in Protestantism, the term holy was attributed, attributed to some believers in particular as a special designation, such as the holy apostle Paul. Uh, Paul's never called a holy apostle in the New Testament, obviously, uh, but even uh, Protestants continue to do so. Similarly, in most recent traditions, the sacraments were called holy. Think of the Holy Eucharist, Holy Baptism, etc., which is not being done in the Bible. Even institution of marriage, especially as restricted to heterosexual couples, is typically called holy, whereas that's never the case in the Bible. In the New Testament, as you may know, it's rather the state of virginity, which comes much closer to, 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 to holiness uh, in the sense of special dedication to God. So we may conclude uh, in section 3 that the use of the concept of sanctity or sacredness displays quite some flexibility but always conveys a special relationship to God that has been installed by God and therefore requires caution and carefulness. All this brings me now to section 4. Um, can the earth be called holy or sacred in a Christian vocabulary? In an exchange which I had about this question in a Dutch newspaper, um, New Testament scholar Sam Janssen denied that this, this is the case. According to him, calling nature sacred would affect the boundary line between creator and creature that is essential to the Christian faith. In my view, Janssen would have been right had he restricted his criticism to the concept of divinity. Nature or the creature world at large can never be, called de can never be deified or divinized in the Christian tradition, first because that would mean idolatry, and second because it would turn nature into an untouchable reality. However eco-friendly we may be, few of us, I guess, would hold that we are not allowed to cultivate nature even to the slightest degree. Uh, we need not be afraid of, of nature, but may cultivate parts of it, bringing about order in it and eating its fruits. Uh, so I'm not advocating an uh, anti-scientific attitude or something like that. Yet if it's true that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, as the psalmist has it, Psalm 24, would that not imply that the earth stands in a special relationship to God? In Old Testament times, it was difficult to articulate that relationship because, as we saw, that will hardly leave any room for commonness or for profanity. If everything is holy, at the end of the day, nothing is. Um, we, however, have come to know that the earth is only a very small and by now deeply threatened part of a vast universe that contains billions of planets and galaxies, as far as we know um, by now, none of which displays any trace of biological life. And even if that may turn out to be false, or if there may turn out to be extraterrestrial life, planet Earth will definitely remain a very special. It's not far-fetched, in my view, to argue that it has a peculiar relationship to God, being elected by God from within the entire universe for a special destination. This is reflected by God's intimate presence to the Earth. According to Psalm 104, the Spirit of God is vivifying all earthlings and, I quote, renewing the face of the ground. Renewing the face of the ground, wonderful expression. So God is intimately involved with planet Earth, an involvement that arguably reaches its climax when God became flesh in Jesus Christ. In brief, planet Earth, and especially the natural world, shares in that specific characteristic which made people and places holy in the biblical literature, namely the special nearness and dedication to God, which distinguished them from the profane realm. In that sense, Christians might call the Earth sacred, and they might even do well to do so now that the planet is in such a vulnerable state. Uh, uh, recall that what is holy is by definition vulnerable because it's open to profanization um, by human misconduct. Now, finally, moving to section five. I still have five minutes. I have one page, if I'm correct. So I'm in time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what difference does it make? Because you may, you may counter to my uh, argument thus far. Well, that's, that's, that's all fine, but it's just semantic. What difference does it make as in, in actual practice? So um, um, I readily concede that the invocation of the sacred is by no means a guarantee against abuse. And in fact, the concept can even be used to exclude and exploit other people, saying I'm holy, you are not, or, or this is holy, you should keep away from that, uh, because I say so. So um, it's no guarantee for, for proper conduct and proper uh, relating to, 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 the, to planet Earth. Uh, yet, um, uh, using it in such a way is definitely a distortion and perversion of a truly transcendent notion of sacredness. I'm now drawing on uh, US theologian and agrarianist Norman Witzba. I don't know whether you know him. Norman Witzba, he argues what makes an encounter with the sacred genuine is that it induces dispositions like respect, humility, responsibility, gratitude, and generosity. End of quote. 
Witzbach goes on to suggest that this notion of sacrality presupposes a context in which transcendence is taken seriously. Indeed, from a Christian point of view, planet Earth can never be sacred as a property of its own, but only as something that's invested on it by God and testifies to its special relationship to God. To quote Wiesbach once more, without a transcendent divine context that is both beyond the universe and within it, the grounds for speaking of the universe as a sacred gift to be received, cherished and celebrated evaporate. Affirming a transcendent source is crucial because it communicates a divine intention that desires for the universe to be and in its creation also affirms its being as good and beautiful. End of quote. So according to Witspa, without this affirmation of the goodness of creation, it becomes hard to see why we should act in its favor and against processes that tend to degrade and destroy the earth. Since in that case, uh, if you don't have this transcendent grounding, then uh, these processes which destroy the earth uh, just belong to the many movements of matter, uh, which have no specific value. So they just are what they are, neither good nor bad. So talk of the sacredness of the earth should be embodied in a context of divine transcendence in order to be transformative. In such a way, calling the earth sacred may inspire and motivate us to engage its entangled systems in a more respectful way than we used to do, acknowledging its integrity and its intimate connection to God as its creator, sustainer and redeemer. Also, it may help us to qualify the deep-seated intuition that for God to be honored, this world should be devalued because of its inferior status in comparison with, with the world that is to come. In one word, it may help us to more emphatically see the Christian faith as world affirming. Thus, it may be very timely for Christians to start seeing the natural environment as sacred. What is sacred, by definition, evokes awe and respect. And this may be precisely the attitude that planet Earth should evoke. To be sure, the sacrality of nature should not prevent us from making appropriate use of it. That would be overly romantic and unrealistic. Uh, but it should urge us to think twice before we start an enterprise that, when universalized, would severely wound and damage the planet. For we have only one costly earth in the entire universe. Thus we need not follow the example of Dutch theologian Arnold van Ruder, who a bit playfully, to be sure, called all matter holy, in an anti-Platonic mood, he said all matter is holy. Um, that would indeed leave nothing profane and undo the special character and destination of the sacred. But especially in our Anthropocene era, we should consider seeing our planet, with all its inhabitants, as standing in a very precious and special relationship to God, radiating God's very presence. And if contemporary biblical scholars are correct, like John Walton, that in the first chapters of Genesis, the earth is actually modeled after an ancient Near Eastern temple in which God enters upon completion of his creative work, there is even direct biblical theological ground for doing so. But even if one disagrees with uh, John Walton here, Christians still have ample reason not to leave the confession of nature's sacrality to be a spécialité de la maison of other religions. In one word, we need not divinize or glorify the earth in order to treat it with respect and awe as sacred, thus countering the desacralization of nature. Thank you. Thank you, Gisbert. I'm sure that's a paper that's going to attract some questions. And we have one, please. Thank you very much for a very interesting paper. Um, you mentioned the Eastern tradition. Um, so they have a very strong uh, tradition for a theophanic imminence of uh, the Logos in all things, uh, without going as far as pantheism, but maybe panentheism. Would you say something about that as a route to arguing for the sacredness of the earth? Yeah, I think that's not a route to, uh, to do so, to uh, construct an argument. So uh, I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be uh, uh, opposed to that myself, I believe, but I do realize that if I want to convince my fellow Protestant believers, I may rather start from the Bible, as I did in this paper, rather than, than trying to move them to take panentheism seriously, because they would easily associate that with... There are lots of... It's rooted in Scripture, you know. Yeah, Acts, Acts 17, Romans yeah. 11, Acts 17. Yeah, you, you are right. But that would be a detour for me, because I first had to do this, and then I could uh, go to the holiness. So I, I, I would prefer, I think, to, to do it more directly uh, in, in this way. But I'm very open to explore this, this alternative further, and I do take it seriously. Because in, um, I'm not convinced that sacredness uh, 
should be only maintained on classical theism. Uh, in traditional pantheistic models, in, in indigenous religions, the world is considered sacred, but there's no transcendence. There's no transcendence, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, so the, no, not having transcendence is not, uh, does not oppose its having uh, a sacredness of the world. Um, it might even, to an extent, reinforce it because there's some sort of direct imminence of the relationship because the world is divine uh, and vice versa, there's a distinction. Um, hmm. So I just wanted to uh, put that out and have your uh, insight on this. Yeah, so, so I was uh, drawing on Norman Witzbach here, and Norman Witzbach is arguing with, with people like Thomas Berry, so these naturalist uh, big history people who try to, to construct a big history in, ev in evolutionary perspective, uh, which is not theistic, but still spiritual to some extent. And over against them, he argues that to be really uh, transformative, uh, uh, you, you need to have a kind of transcendence. So, so if you have purely an imminent picture, then, then it, that doesn't become clear why it should prompt us to certain forms of action. Um, so the context in which this argument was made was not directly in relation to indigenous religion. I would be open myself and curious myself to um, to find out how Witzbach would, would um, argue in that context, whether he would uphold the same argument. Uh, we do know, of course, that uh, we should not be overly romantic, I guess, about the extent to which um, those, for example, in Eastern religions have been able to avoid ecological destruction, even though I do realize that in many indigenous traditions, this is a much more respectful way of dealing with, with nature, uh, which is due to the fact that people are more from the inside as they're familiar with natural processes and seem to intuitively know about the consequences of what they are doing. So, yeah, so that's as far as I can go now, I believe. Um, uh, one more thought might be that even if they are, even if they do not, do not officially recognize some transcendence, their notion of sacredness implicitly um, assumes some sort of transcendence. That that would not a, that would be not a line of that could be explored further. I would think. We have a question from Paul on the last So Paul, uh, thank you very much. For, uh, that's very helpful. I, I was curious about the definition of holiness. As you said, sacred versus profane. You have this problem of if everything is sacred, then it has no meaning because it's profane. But which is how most theologians ever think pseudo sacred. But uh, there's uh, I've read a few Old Testament scholars who argue that holiness in the Old Testament actually means more like devotedness, where something is devoted to God, which does not require you know an, an opposite profaneness uh, yeah. yeah. to it. You mm. know what I'm saying? So I wonder if that would help. Yeah, it, it being devoted to God, holiness in this, uh, you, you don't you don't have this I guess drawback of Everything being, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so of course, I must apologize for, for, for uh, only being able to, to give a very short glance of what, what's, what's going on. It's, it could be expanded and should be expanded much more extensively, of course. Um, so, so, so I, I didn't, I, I was hesitant to come up with a very clear definition of holiness or sacredness, but. I circumscribed it in terms of being uh, sending in a special relationship to God, and this specialness uh, presupposes or assumes that there is a kind of uh, commonness as well, which, which does not require such, such a special. This, this relationship has been installed by God. That's the that's the claim, I think. If you call the Eucharist holy, you suggest that's that's installed by God. That that's actually the claim which is behind it. So, uh, and of course, what follows from that is that we should be devote, devoted to God ourselves. As well, so so there's a kind of ethical um, um, uh, consequence of this of this uh, of, the, of this notion. Um, and as I said, in the eschatological end times, it seems that indeed the boundary line between the sacred and the profane uh, collapses. So so so, and that may be due to the fact that finally all of creation is devoted to God, as you as you suggest. The way you answer the question corresponds actually to what I had answered at the very beginning, but you invited us. So uh, just one remark and that's a fine question. Uh, of course, the, the idea of the holy is the title of uh, an important book by Rudolf Ockham, yeah. and perhaps there may be interesting links there. Yeah, thank you. The creature, the and so on. That's a classic, yeah. My question is, 
I was wondering how you would link this up with an eschatological um, uh, understanding of uh, so especially the kind of biblical remark that we are citizens of heaven in a sense you know which he seems to put pressure on the idea of us belonging to this earth belonging to this material universe we need to be as it were on the go we are pilgrims pilgrims towards something else which is a super creation in a sense would you see this as helping us in that eschatological reflection um, yes, I think so. I'm a bit wary about taking the notion of heaven literally here. So let's just hear about a paper by, I think it was Dan Barrett, who was drawing on Tom Wright to suggest that heaven is not the final state of, uh, of Christians. So I tend to, if you say we are citizens of heaven, I tend to take that as we are citizens of the new, renewed creation, uh, which is not a spiritual kind of thing, but an embodied uh, world in, in, in a renewed way. But that, that won't be the difference between the two of us, I guess. So, uh, yes, I think that we are, that fact that we are on our way as pilgrims suggests that we have to prepare for this new creation to come uh, by devoting our lives to that and to the kingdom of God. Um, uh, is, is that a way to answer your question? I suppose so. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on that point, I think we should stop and thank for that very clear paper and one that I think we shall continue to think about. We may not have an answer to the question yet, mm, but yeah. there will come a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you.